Welcome to Keeping the World Company on Think Tech Hawaii. I'm your host, Jay Fidel. Today, we'll talk about Steve Bannon, and he's Trump's ideologue. Our guest for the show is Gene Rosenfeld, independent scholar. And uh, we're going to talk about where Steve Bannon came from, uh, what his training was, where he developed his um, provocateur approach to things, and the movements he has created, and the risks and, and threats that he poses to the country and his connection with Donald Trump. Welcome to the show, Gene. Thank you, Jay. Why don't you give us a, a little précis on who this man is, because he's, he's somebody we need to know about. Okay, I'll do my best. Uh, he's somebody I've been following for many years because every revolutionary movement needs its ideologue, its propagandist. And I uh, kind of uh, fingered Steve Bannon for being that guy for this mega movement that we have now. He uh, sort of perched on Trump's shoulder the first seven months of his uh, presidency and whispered in his ear and Trump listened. Of course, Trump can't get along with anybody that's too close to him for quite a while. So uh, Bannon left and he's not an organization man anyway. Nevertheless, he's continued to have an outsized influence on the MAGA movement, which has grown. So where is Stu Bannon from? He's a middle class guy from Virginia. He went to Virginia Tech. Um, he was in the military uh, for several years. He got an MBA from Harvard and started his own financial company. And then somehow he got into um, communication and entertainment. Uh, we, he kind of came on the scene as the uh, founder of Breitbart News, an online uh, extreme right newspaper media site. And he says now, he just gave an interview to David Brooks, uh, that he started Breitbart because he wanted a basically a megaphone for the alt-right. And if you don't know what the alt-right is, um, that's the extreme. Because Richard Spencer, who's the head of basically the American National Socialist Movement, although that's not what its name is, um, he coined the term alternative right, alt-right. And like alternative facts that Kelly Con and Conway came up with, it's a different view of the world. It, it, it wants to save the white race. And we know this from David Duke. He says, well, I'm really not against anybody. I'm just for saving the white race. They're only 8% of the globe. And if we don't save them, they're gonna be um, genetically uh, extinguished. And to him, that's a kind of genocide. So Steve Bannon has these kinds of connections. He's a mouthpiece that brings this extreme view, which can only ever really energize a small group of people because it's so extreme. He brings it into the world in an acceptable way. And of course, when he left Trump's administration, he had a podcast. Years ago, when he was in Hollywood, he made 18 films, by the way, in Hollywood, and living in Santa Monica, he read a book called The Fourth Turning by two guys in Santa Monica at the time, William Strauss and Neil Howe. These were the guys who posed as scholars. I say posed because they really have a, a very um, non-view, non-scholarly view of history. And they uh, coined the term millennial generation. They're the guys that gave us that, that phrase. And they have generational theory that they've written several books on, made a lot of money. But in fact, if you are a historian or you've been trained as a historian, as I have by some very good people, um, you know better. When you read their book, they call it the fourth turning and American prophecy. And then they say, this is history. They go back in history to the pre-Roman group, the Etruscans, um, and they use their religion as a basis for history as we know it. They say, well, the Etruscans had a natural religion based on the four seasons, the four generations or stages of the human life span. Say a person lives to be 80 years old, that's four generations, 20 years or four, four eras of a life. Um, and it talks about um, four turnings in history. 
that there are generations in history and each generation has its own um, flavor, you might say. Uh, first generation is a kind of awakening and those are the artists. And the second generation um, is uh, uh, a, a prophet. Uh, the second, the third generation is a nomad where everything unravels. We're sort of, well, we're really past that now. We've unraveled. And according to Bannon in his, in his documentary, quote, quote, film, Generation Zero, that unraveling took place in the 1960s. Um, and the third, gen the fourth turning is the one he's really focused on, which is crisis, which really means almost apocalypse. Uh, Steve Bannon is very motivated by images of war. If you if you if you Google his documentary and watch it, Generation Zero, you will see many images of things blowing up. Uh, and he talks in his current interview with David Brooks about the war that's coming, the revolution. That's what MAGA is all about. It's about a revolution that will turn us away from the unraveling in the, of the 1960s of diversity of uh, women's rights. Uh, we know all this already because the Supreme Court is doing it. Um, and, and of acceptance of people who are different. There is an undercurrent of bigotry here. It turns out Bannon claims he is not anti-Semitic. However, he is anti-Asian. Uh, he has criticized uh, Harvard for, uh, and, and other uh, institutions. Uh, oh, Silicon Valley primarily, which he's involved in with his internet outreach. He, he's really criticized Silicon Valley for having so many Asian CEOs. Uh, this should be a warning light in everybody's head because any kind of bigotry or racism is a signal of uh, basically fascism. And I believe that Steve Bannon is a fascist. What also plays into his fascism is the fact that he's an unreconstructed Southerner. Um, he, he, he talks about Lincoln as being a military dictator and uh, what Lincoln did did not, in the second inaugural address was not bind the nation's wounds and bring people together, but look at what he did. He burned the South down. Um, so, and that's what Bannon would like. He would like to, burned down. He would like the fourth turning to be a time of catastrophe and war, where we turn around this country and we return to the concept, the MAGA narrative about the founders being Christian and um, that only certain people can really be Americans, of mass deportations of any foreigners, um, of uh, a power play by the president and the military to do basically bring about sea changes, get rid of diversity, get rid of LBGTQ uh, transgender rights in particular. That's something that goes international with Russia as well. Uh, so there's all these warning signals with Bannon. He says there cannot be compromise. He says to David Brooks, well, we talk about you conservatives. You know, you're reasonable people. We're not reasonable. There is nothing reasonable about this. There's nothing to talk about. We're just going to do it. And then he points to the head of the Heritage Foundation, um, Kevin Roberts, who is a legitimate PhD and scholar that has a very retrograde view of history that Bannon's very comfortable with. And I don't know what his deeper feelings are about things, but he's a scholar. He's a Catholic and he's an ultra conservative. Bannon is also a Catholic. And so you put all these things together and you come up with a, a real nice varietal of American fascism, which I've been focusing on for many years. Every revolution has its ideologue. Marx was the ideologue for the Russian revolution. And I'm not gonna compare Bannon to, to Marx. I mean, Marx had a lot more on the ball than Bannon did, but, he is trying to be the ideologue for the MAGA revolution and for the second presidency of Donald Trump to implement the Heritage Foundation um, organization of our society as something like not quite the handmaid's tale, but on that order.
Okay. I mean, when I looked uh, looked him up, um, I came away with the notion that he was uh, beyond all other things a provocateur, and I wondered whether that provocation was a way to get attention or sincere, and I wonder now whether he is just as loony as he can be, or whether there's a rationality about him. Um, because I, you know, or is he still looking for attention? Is he still looking to to have power as a provocateur? Where is he coming from on this? Because he's changed his position over the years, or at least he's lied about his position over the years. And I, and I just wonder where his, you know, real self is. Do you have any thoughts on that? Yes, we've seen his types in smaller examples of what's going on with the larger MAGA movement, which is a neo-fascist movement today in our country. And we've seen that in things like Jonestown and um, the Branch Davidians and the Solar Temple and Om Shinri Kyo and these groups that either incur persecution on the part of the authorities or who uh, practice violence, the most extreme type of of that type of new religious movement or what people call cults is um, Al-Qaeda. has the same format, the same structure, and so does MAGA. It can, it can illuminate these people on the larger level. Um, these are revolutionary. Uh, they're not looking, they're looking to overturn norms and to get enough emotional traction and you only do that if you're a true believer and Bannon's a true believer. He has his own concoction of what he calls spiritual, but he does believe that we really need a cleansing. Ekpyrosis is what the uh, fourth turning authors call it. In the fourth turning, you're supposed to be an ekpyrosis. What does that mean? Fancy Greek word for a conflagration, a great fire, an apocalypse, something like we're seeing unfortunately in the wars that we've returned to that look more like world war ii um, and the great battles of world war ii than the sort of controlled if i can put it that way wars he's into um, chaos um is is that the world that he seeks i mean if you if you had to connect the dots on him uh what world does he want uh, does he want uh, an apocalypse? Does he want uh, humanity to be killed, um, undermined in, in all civil society? Is that what's on his mind? And how does that benefit anyone? Oh, a revolutionary is a person who's where the means justifies the end, which, by the way, is the opposite of Catholic theology, um, where they're focused on the means, which is violent, because they really do feel that society is enduring such carnage. I mean, he wrote the inaugural address, American Carnage, that it's undergoing such a decline that it's been so polluted by the impure people who have caused these terrible changes like abortion, <laughs> making abortion available, um, that the only way to get rid of it is to burn it up it's kind of, you know, what they used to do with uh, witches is burn them because they were so impure, they didn't want anything left of them. Well, you, it's kind of a witchcraft for society. I mean, we're only burning books right now, so to speak, but it will turn into attacks on people. And look at what the Supreme Court has done. It's given a president the license to arrest, incarcerate people, or assassinate them even. So this all plays into his vision of what is coming. And in the book, The Fourth Prophecy, he really believes in this myth that it's gonna happen. And this is the hero generation. He's gonna lead the hero generation into the ekpyrosis in order to completely destroy the corruption that the people who animated the 60s and the left-wingers have wrought upon society. And he's, they're going to build a whole new society. They'll start a new calendar, which they always do. I mean, the French Revolution 
had a new calendar and in in uh you know the the nazi playbook for the united states um the turner diaries you start out with a new calendar because you have a new world it's a new world well you know um i, I have a couple of questions that spring out of that one of them is who who would buy into that what what kind of an individual would join a movement like that except those principles except that um that that goal that vision uh why in the world would anyone do that and who is doing it and why are they doing it well okay take the state of nevada you remember the guy that um that confronted the fbi in some kind of government reserve taking over public land and the fbi confronted him for several days and there i think there was one person who died but they never and 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 then they pressed charges and the jury didn't convict um that has happened in the united states before in the 1990s there were a lot of these confrontations with guys like that and and what happens is that the people in the rural areas of this country really have been ignored by the coastal communities and by what the MAGA movement calls the elites. They have some genuine grievances. In the 1970s, farmers were committing suicide. Banks were uh, taking over their um, properties. The IRS was prosecuting people who weren't paying their taxes. Um, the uh, small towns of the United States are burnt out places. Young people don't want to stay there. They they want to go to the cities. And so the, the country is, is changing and it's got a whole class of people that feel unheard, ignored, persecuted, and they want to blame somebody. So here you come up with a movement that sanitizes some of the grosser aspects, the ultra-violent and our anti-Semitic, racist, genocidal aspects of an underbelly of neo-fascism. And they they sanitize that and present it as an alternative. That's why it's called alt-right. You don't have to be a conservative because they don't listen to you anyway. They just talk and they don't care. And they're the ones getting all of the degrees from the Ivy League un universities, and they're useless people. We need people with guns. <laughs> I mean, the Second Amendment is is a sacred trust for this group, believe me, um, who can uh, do something. And, and Steve Bannon talks in this interview, what can we do something? We don't talk. Join your school board, you know, burn the books, um, confront people, dox them. I don't know if you heard the Stormy Daniels or saw the Stormy Daniels interview with uh, Rachel Maddow yesterday, but here you have an elite Harvard trained Rhodes Scholar interviewing a woman who's come up and made her living uh, in the porn industry, smartly, by the way, um, who has been dumped on by this whole movement for speaking out. She's kind of an anti-hero. She was subpoenaed. She came to testify under a subpoena and she told the truth as far as she's concerned and as far as the jury is concerned. So it's, it's really irrational. You know, I mean, you have Bannon uh, talking about how he represents the great unwashed. You know, all of the neglected people in this country whose grievances haven't been heard. But he himself has, I think, a couple of nice condos. He's made a lot of money. <laughs> in the financial and entertainment industry. Uh, he was with Goldman Sachs for a while. Yeah, he was with Goldman Sachs when he when he left uh, his har Harvard <laughs> with his MBA. And his uh, he makes a big deal out of the fact that um, the young people that are going to West Point, including his daughter, who's at West Point, that these young people um are really the backbone of america and they all think like he does they come from small towns and rural areas and so forth and so on so he sees himself as leading kind of a peasant revolt <laughs> against the powers that be he has technology at his fingertips he's very adept at it he has communication strategy 
He's a national figure who's scrambled up from the outside. Trump has come basically down from the nouveau riche and his father's millionaire status to meet the great unwashed. And Steve Bannon has come up from the ranks, but they think alike. As you mentioned, um, Bannon is the ideologue for Trump, but they don't necessarily get along. Uh, he, he left the White House and, uh, you know, I suppose he had an argument with Trump and it's really an open question about whether he'll have any influence on Trump or at least White House presence on Trump going forward if Trump wins or takes power. So I guess the question is what, you know, these are parallel tracks. What, what Trump is doing maybe was influenced by, by Bannon, um, but Bannon is on one track, Trump is on the other track. Where do the twain meet? Uh, are, they, are they competitive? Are they working together? Are they collaborating in some way? Or are they just taking different roads to get to similar places? The latter. They are both occupying necessary roles in a revolutionary structure. Uh, on the one hand, Bannon is an independent operator. He's made, he's, he's an entrepreneur. He's actually done quite well on everything that he's taken on, but he's not an easy guy to get along with personally. And as you know, Trump, as I said, the guy makes enemies out of his friends and friends out of his enemies. And he cycles like somebody with uh, bipolar in doing that. So you never know if today you're his friend or his enemy. Look at Kim Jong Un. <laughs> you know, he loved him one day, he hated him the next day. That's not the point. The point is they agree as to what's going to happen, how it's going to happen, and what's to be done, and how to increase power, how to concentrate power in the hands of those people who alone can fix it. That's what it's all about. And Bannon has done a great deal to jumpstart a lot of local organizations, which is where MAGA is very strong, and the think tank, the Heritage Foundation, which is planning a lot of the programs for the second Trump administration, if it comes to that, is one of the most influential uh, foundations in the entire world and has like 50 million subscribers. Well, even if there is no second Trump administration for any reason, and we can only hope, um, but it seems to me that Steve Bannon will go forward. He will maintain his movement and his movement might get stronger depending. Um, so uh, we are not out of harm's way as far as that is concerned if Trump doesn't get into power, right? No, this movement has become much bigger than Trump. This has been the great revolutionary movement that the uh, American uh, fascists in league with the Ku Klux Klan have wanted for a hundred years and have been working toward. So um, the great independent scholar who has chronicled the rise of uh, the fascist movement uh, in the United States is Leonard Zeskind. And uh, he is, if you wanna know more about it, read his book. There are others that have done it too. But the fact is that it was already there with David Duke and Richard Spencer and Aryan Nation and goes way back to Posse Comitatus, the Ku Klux Klan. All of these things, all of these dots can be connected. They had no power to move the American population until MAGA came along. And Bannon was the guy who said, where did MAGA come from? The Tea Party. And he was big, you know, in support of the Tea Party. Bannon uh, is, says that Trump actually is more conservative than he is. And the, people, <laughs> the people who really form the base of MAGA. They have their own agendas. And yeah. it strikes me from what you have said right here today, Jean, is that Trump makes friends and then changes friends and makes enemies out of friends and vice versa and all that. And, and then, you know, we've established that they're on pathways that are similar and are maybe leading to similar places. 
And if this is the other side of that coin, if Trump gets back into the White House, you know, I can see there's a real possibility, logical possibility, um, that he will bring he will bring Bannon in with him or work with him in a very collaborative fashion. And the two of them together, that would be terrifying. One way or another, he needs a true believer like Bannon, an agitator, an effective agitator, uh, to keep the ranks excited, mobilized, and ready to do his bidding. Stand back and stand by. That's the watchword. Mm. And Bannon went gleefully to prison for four months as a true believer and hero, because he does believe in the fourth turning. He believes the, he is leading the hero generation and that it's inevitable it's going to happen. We're going to have an ectpyrosis, an apocalypse, and then we're going to rebuild. Yeah, what, is that, what does that prison term mean in terms of his activity, his image? and the, mm, the sensibilities of those who follow him in, the, in this movement. Does it help him? I mean, after all, Hitler went to prison and actually at the end of the day, it helped him. Is, is this something that Bannon likewise uh, sees that will help him? If Trump is elected again, we'll be at 1933 when uh, Hitler became chancellor of Germany. And then what did he do? Hannah Arendt in her great book on origins of totalitarianism says this is what Hitler did immediately. Two things, propaganda and organization. The German people weren't all in with him because he still represented a minority of them. Remember that von Hindenburg, the great hero and chancellor of Germany, gave him the keys to the kingdom, made him chancellor with von Papen, uh, uh, thinking that they could, they could use Hitler, then, not that Hitler was going to use them. Immediately, Hitler formed a propaganda ministry with Goebbels, and we have a uh, wonderful documentation of the fact that they needed to change the entire mindset of the German population, Hitler's mindset. And that's what they set about doing very rationally and scientifically. And these were the social media guys, the internet guys of their generation. And that's what Bannon is. He's used social media to propagate a narrative of the fourth turning. He sold that to MAGA and to Trump, not alone by himself, but he's been very influential in doing that. And so that's what the first thing, the big thing that needs to be continued is you need to broadcast your narrative and what's you know your, your whole ideology, basically and create this fictitious world that the people believe in. And many people in the MAGA movement already believe. You wonder how they believe that. Well, because it's been ingrained in them this way. It's been, it's been attract, they've attract, been attracted to it. They haven't been brainwashed. They've chosen it. It explains things for them. It's, it's something they would live by and maybe die for, okay? That's what you need to create a revolution. The other thing is the organization. It's already started and the Heritage De uh, Foundation, and Kevin Roberts are, are working on that because what's gonna happen is you're going to transform institutions from within. We've seen this, the Republican party now is a mega party. We've seen that the structure remains but it's an empty corpse until it's filled with the spirit of the people who are loyalists for Trump. And he did that. He replaced the head of the Republican National Committee. And everybody else has to fall into line. And I know from my um, study of experiments in social psychology that 65% of the people will fall in line. And that's just about the amount of people in the Republican Party who've done that. What's really ironic is that because of the shadow and possible implications of the immunity decision a few days ago, it's incredible, um, Judge Meshan, in the New York criminal trial has delayed the sentencing until I, I want to say uh, September sometime. Um, and so Trump won't get sentenced until September. Uh, and and the, uh, the irony there is that uh, that falls within the four months of Bannon's imprisonment. 
So if he orders imprisonment, and really on a logical basis, he should. Now, Bannon was in prison for ignoring a subpoena. Uh, if uh, Trump is, is, is um, you know, doing all the things he did, he should, he should go to jail for even a longer period. And likewise in the Washington federal case. But what, what I find ironic is that they may both be in jail at the same time. Um, you know, just a few weeks before the election. How, how does that affect, um, you know, the public perception of this? How did that affect the election? How did that affect Trump and Bannon and the way they spin all this? Well, you know, I'm a historian of symbolism of what symbols uh, create change in history and symbols do. Mythology does. Calendars do. Numbers do. There's a numerology to what you're talking about. We're talking about four months. And, and the number four is sacred here when we talk about the fourth turning and uh, the four stages of life and, uh, and the four seasons, uh, et cetera. Well, those four months also remain before the election and Biden is, is facing a, a, a crisis of his own. And this is an era that a fourth turning that Steve Bannon believes is the, the crisis era. And it's also Trump. Uh, still waiting in the wings and wondering uh, what the court's going to do and what the voters are going to do. So the number four is now very, very important in history and has meaning um, to those who buy into the myth. Uh, and if you want to know the details of how Trump as an administrator views what he needs to do in his second administration. Read the first inaugural address he gave that Steve Bannon and, and Stephen Miller wrote. Stephen Miller, by the way, is an acolyte of Steve Bannon's. Um, Stephen Miller is from Santa Monica, grew up, went to Santa Monica High. And Steve Bannon uh, uh, was had his offices in Santa Monica after the last race riots. And, LA, a lot of the studio heads went to Santa Monica. They felt safer there. Um, and so, and at the same time, the guys who wrote The Fourth Turning were there also. So it's kind of a little um, nexus of ideology and numerology and mythology and action for uh, MAGA and Trump right there. Well, you know, this discussion and, um, you know, finding out more about Steve Bannon, his history and his uh, thought process and the, the strength of his movement and all those people from, do you remember that movie, The Last Picture Show in Texas? You know, this is, this is, this is a result of that movie. And that movie was a long time ago already. Uh, mm -hmm. we, we should have seen it from that movie. Um, mm -hmm. In any event, um, all this is not good news. His, um, his affinity for Trump, Trump's uh, treating him as an ideologue, um, the, the really chilling, um, haunting um, relationship of what he's doing, they're doing with what Hitler did um, is, is very troubling. And I, I have to say that this discussion doesn't make me feel uh, any better about it, Gene. So my question to you is, you know, I suppose that if everyone who opposed the movement and the violence that Bannon is talking about, if, any, if everybody who opposed uh, what was in that inaugural address back when, um, the, uh, the carnage address, if you will, um, voted against Trump, and they were all out there voting like crazy, and it was a landslide victory for Biden or Biden's possible successor candidate, whatever happens here, um, you know, would that stop this? Would that have, what effect would that have on these guys who were trying to be fascists and trying to turn the country upside down and make us lose all the enlightenment of 230 years? It would delay it. And even people very, very high up in the Democratic Party are now saying that too. They recognize that they're dealing with something bigger than Trump something that's not gonna go away. And containing it is going to be the job of the American people. Even if Trump is elected, there will be uh, an ongoing 
learning curve for the American people and for those people who are themselves leaders in in our country, they will um, they will resist. I, I like to point to the columnist Jennifer Rubin. She's a very interesting person. Um, her first words after Trump was elected was resist. And she is a conservative Republican who now is voting Democratic, but runs a column answering people's questions all the time about some of the things that you've been raising, which are very important. And she's she is a strong-minded person who is an example of others who will continue to monitor a Trump administration, who will continue to speak out, but it it may get very nasty because people like Bannon believe this is necessary and this gives them the carte blanche to go forward in um, participating in the fourth turning. And I might say too, that even people like Fareed Zakaria and David Frum who've debated Steve Bannon, when Bannon has brought up the fourth turning, they've just totally ignored what he said. I mean, you really have to read that book and understand how much it means to Stephen Bannon and how much he translates that to the MAGA movement and how much people are buying from that mythology to, to realize that there is a strong undercurrent for revolution in this country uh, to overturn what they regard as the uh, satanic revolution of the 1960s and its aftermath. Uh, we have to treasure the First Amendment. We have to treasure the vote. Um, we have to protect um, the institutions of our democracy. And may I say this, and I don't mean it in a religious sense, may God help us. Thank you so much. Jean Rosenfeld, independent scholar of history, religion, and, and other things that relate to terrorism. Thank you so much, Jean.